Well, it was the four one TE is the uh, you know you worked on the uh, the Dodge Stratus and the Dodge Caravan, right? That's what the transmission is in those uh, two vehicles, the forty one TE. Now most transmissions have solenoids or the packs on the valve body or the pan. The Dodge Caravan and the Stratus, the PT Cruiser, and some of the other ones had the solenoids right here on the outside of the transmission in a pack. And uh, it's pretty cool. Now there's what the solenoids look like on a typical valve body. Now, shift solenoids are when they're energized, the exhaust line pressure being sent to the shift valve, and spring force moves the shift valve so that the valve blocks the port, prevents line pressure from being around in the collector of the band. And that's kind of what you're looking like on the inside of it. You know, you can basically, uh, you can blow in the end of a solenoid and energize it, and, and, you know, and then de-energize it until it, it's changed in state. And that's the kind of thing. Uh, Jimmy worked on one in here one day that didn't have any second gear, and he replaced the shift solenoid, and then he found a piece of a, a little shop rag string that was hung between the uh, shift valve, the second, you know, the one-two shift valve, and the valve body board to make it stick. A basic transmission solenoid, a solenoid off, the pressure is dumped, the clutch receives no pressure, pressure is relieved, and you see this red part down here is obviously fluid. Uh, the basic transmission solenoid on, it closes that, and the pressure goes to the clutch. Is that complicated? Not really, is it? Now, the 41 e solenoid pack is pretty easy to replace and a lot simpler to get than most solenoid packs. They got these at the first store. Most of the time, you can just call down there and they'll bring you one. They don't cost very much. Uh, I say they don't care if it costs very much. I guess it's a relative thing. The last one of them I bought was about $150, but uh, we uh, we had a transmission one time that had a, uh, it was a van. You know, I think I mentioned it before. We thought it, we thought it, it, it looked like it was getting water in it. And because uh, it had the milky looking a little bit, it wasn't shifting right. And I says, uh, so how can water get in the transmission? First thing, huh? Well, that's a good point. If they're if they're driving in high water, they can. Yeah, that's right. But also, on a lot of them, most of them, as a matter of fact, they go through the radiator, right? Go through the radiator cooling belt. That one, it had an external cooler, but it still had water in it, and she hadn't been driving in the water. I don't know how that water got in there. But we did a full fluid exchange to replace the solenoid pack, and so. We fix that one that way. You know, of course, there's some people with real sticklers will say, if you ever get any idea there's been any water in there, you got to rebuild the whole transmission, you know. Well, on that one, the proof was in the pudding because she drove that thing for years. After that, never had any more trouble with it. You know? uh, but anyway, some of them have packs up under here on the valve body. And this one right here, the one that Robert's working on, that uh, photo right there, was off of a 29, uh, 2009 uh, F-250. And we, this little, see this little, uh, this looks like just a plastic thing you plugged into your solenoids. That is actually the shift, uh, I mean that's the transmission computer and it also contains a couple of uh, uh, uh speed sensors that are all made together. Now in the, uh, uh, in some, in the 09 model you had to replace the whole valve body uh, and you know the big bunch of wires plugged into that on the outside of the case there. And we actually, I can tell you a little more about that one on another day, but that was an interesting situation we're going to on that one. Um, but other transmissions with single solenoids, see how these valves come out of here? And you got a little spring and these little uh, hairpin clips that hold them in there. That's a fairly common setup. There's a solenoid, there's a solenoid. Um, you know, just get used to the look of that, you know, because you don't have that. This right here is the, is the uh, valve, the manual valve, that basically, the, uh, when you put it, you move your pringle stick that one there makes it move back and forth. All right, the 41 GE solenoid pack kits are available with these items included. You can actually get a kit with that sensor, that sensor, and that pack all together. You replace both those sensors and that solenoid pack, you can do it in 30 minutes. It ain't really that hard to do, we'll know. You know. Um, four solenoids provide shift sequence and fill. The light blue, this is the wire you plug into that solenoid pack, or a low reverse solenoid control. The white one, uh, is the T24 solenoid control. The pink one is underdrive solenoid control, and the brown is overdrive solenoid control. All right, so you can kind of get an idea of how it's wired up right here. Uh, you see, and so uh, long and short of it is, this is something that you kind of need to get used to, and uh, that's the transmission uh, 
reading center right there. Um, and notice how the work that feet are numbered. And all the way you see you got eight terminals when we do it. Um, all right. Um, now then, that right there, of course you're looking at. Do a little closer on it. See your solenoids in there? And that's these uh, transmission controller operates at. Some of these units have got a different transmission controller that's not part of the PCM, and some of them controls it all through the PCM. So you got to find out what kind you got. Um, if you ever run into a situation where the transmission shifts crazy until you disconnect the battery and hook it back up, and then it shifts normal, you typically got transmission and computer issues. Uh, there are your exploded views. Uh, there are your second and fourth clutch, a little reverse clutch, see how they're all stacked together. Uh, a lot of the guys that rebuild transmissions will basically have an exploded view like this laid out there on the bench and whenever they're stacking that thing together. And y'all are going to get your hands on some. Um, it might be uh, next month because, uh, anyway, i gotta, I got to set aside some time where you guys can sink your teeth into that because it's going to be fun. Uh, earliest version of the unit was done in 8604, what they call it right there. You can see how all those things are stacked in. you got drums, you got clutches, you got seals, you got pistons. Got springs. There's your overdrive and reverse clutch, lower and reverse clutch, second and fourth clutch. It's a good idea, rather than just seeing a bunch of parts in there, what you need to do is you're pulling this thing out. You need to have actually have your uh, exploded view up so you can identify the parts as you're taking them out. Because if you know you're having a problem, for example, with your lower and your reverse clutch, you need to know what part that is and when you've got your hand on it. Okay, that makes sense. Now, checking the solenoids, the uh, transmission controller monitors each and every solenoid circuit by turning off the solenoid to watch for an approximate 42 volt inductive spike. You can see there's your spike right there on the scope. Uh, and that basically knows that that solenoid is, is uh, electrically sound. Now if you ever have a situation where it knows the solenoid is electrically sound, like on a lot of your GM vehicles, uh, but it's not seeing the gear, gear change when it energizes the solenoid, it will call that a performance fault. That's the way that I understand it. Uh, the pro controller is programmed to keep an ongoing record of each clutch element status during application. And it does that by keeping up with the fluid volume in each clutch circuit. This is on the Chrysler transmissions, on that, that particular one right there. They call it clutch volume index. You don't have this on everybody. Uh, keep up with fluid volumes on the fly. And there's track using hard written data as well as adaptive learning clutch volume volume. This is the Chrysler thing. You see that number there is higher than these. You're typically going to see a higher number on your overdrive clutch volume index, even in normal conditions. So don't let that throw you. You, know. you kind of get you need to get an idea of what's normal, and you can find that in various different places. Uh, typically, uh, the TCM or PCM compares engine or turbine shaft speed to output shaft speed to determine when or whether gear is wet. The turbine shaft, if you remember, is a shaft that's hooked to the center of the torque converter that turns the guts of the transmission. Right? That's the turbine shaft. Okay, if it knows how fast that's turning, and it knows how fast the output's turning, then it's going to be able to tell if it's in the right gear or not. If it's telling it to be in third gear, it knows how fast those two shafts ought to be turning. Right? Now the engine speed and the turbine speed are not always going to be the same, are they? Unless the torque converter is locked up. If the torque converter is in a lockup, full lockup, 100%, the engine speed and the turbine speed will be the same. All right. Now then, you see, there's the two sensors right there I was talking about. When the torque converter locked at 100%, the turbine shaft spin at exactly the same speed as the engine. And that usually happens only in third and fourth gear. During that time, it's easier for the PCM to detect a slipping condition, whether with a torque converter or applied clutches. So if it's got engine speed same as turbine speed, which the turbine speed is when it you know, comes out in the middle and goes into the transmission, uh, it actually is going to watch for slipping or incorrect gear show, a gear ratio, you know, obtain in whatever gear. When the converter is fully applied, all this turns as one piece. These shells are welded together, that one and that one. And what is this? Stator with a one-way clutch. Turbine. Short converter clutch is actually applied here whenever there's fluid pressure that pushes it in there so that it applies. And it's hooked directly into the turbine shaft. And you can see with all that stuff out of the way. See? Uh, now, the, uh, that is actually splined on the back of, of this, is what it amounts to, and there's your turbine shaft. When this is throwing oil against that, that's what starts turning that turbine shaft. And this is what gives you your torque multiplication. 
remember that. So how does it know when a clutch is a flat or slipping? If the output you have the real speed sensor is 2,000, the algorithm table will multiply that RPM figure by the ratio of the gear, and uh, the, it knows it, sh whenever it should be engaged in a certain gear. It knows the ratio, and it's basically typed in the On that particular transmission area, your input speed and your output speed are measured all the time. Now, with slippage or non-application, you might see codes incorrect gear ratio obtained for whatever gear or two, three shift error. Now, if, if the rate, your overdrive ratio is 696, multiply that by 2,000. This is something I showed you the other day, if there's no slip. See, that's how that's going to be the output. So 2,000 coming in ought to be 1,392 coming out, if there's no slip in that particular ratio. Uh, accepted CVI tolerances on the 41TE. If you look at your, uh, look at the one you're working on for good numbers, but back in the day, uh, it's always a good idea to look at good numbers on every vehicle within the scan tool so you can get used to what the numbers are supposed to be. That makes sense? Low reverse would be 35 to 83. That one scan tool we had had a low reverse deal going on and it called it left rear. Whoever typed the stuff in the scan tool didn't realize that was low reverse. All right. Uh, 2-4, 20 to 77, over, uh, overdrive, notice how that's higher, underdrive is 24 to 70. These are, these are normal numbers. If you see it outside of that, you need to go in there and build it, you know, uh, or replace it. Instantaneous fluid volume to track using clutch fill volume. That's usually useful for closely placed shifts or the driver's change of mind shifts. I think I'll get on it, Ooh, you know, this kind of thing. Piston here and pinches these fiber and steel plates together when fluid pressure applies. And when you pinch these together, what's planted on the inside, what's planted on the outside becomes one piece. That's how that transmission works. Early models would use their learned values if the battery had been disconnected or the TCM was unplugged, and then the TCM goes to a default setting until new CVI values are learned, so it has to sometimes learn on the go. Late model vehicles and flash updated TCM will remember the learned CVI value even if the battery's been disconnected. But what if you want the TCM to forget them? Look on your scan tool for battery disconnect reset, and that will force erase the CVI values and reset them to the default. This girl here was uh, the cousin of a previous student. He sent her over here, and she said that this thing would jerk a crick in your neck whenever it shifted. And when she was driving, and she, did, she could feather the gas and make it shift nicely. But she said if she just drove off like she would normally take off, it'd go bam, and it would just throw your, you know, and so I said, well, let's put, a, I put the old gray scan tool on it that we got, you know, when you use this morning, take it down the road. And I noticed that whenever it did this, it, went, it jumped from second to fourth. And I was perusing the scan tool, and I came across a setting, and this was on the Hyundai Santa Fe, and it said reset transmission adaptive learning tables or something like that. And I told her, I said, pull off the side of the road. So we pull off the side of the road, and uh, I said, uh, switch the car off. So we switched it off. I said, now switch it back on. She cranked it back up. I said, no, I didn't say crank it back up. I said, switch the car off and just turn the key back on. People do that, you know, switch it off and switch it back on. You fired up. So anyway, I, I, I reset the depth. Are you, you sure you want to do this? Yes, I want to do this. I said, now drive it down the road and I want you to make it shift just as hard as you can make it shift. I mean, I want to jerk a crick in my neck. She couldn't get that thing to shift hard another time. And she said, oh, it appears to be fixed. I said, well, you know, she was watching what I was doing on the scan tool. And I said, uh, she says, I've saved up $1,600 to buy a transmission, and now I can spend that money on something else. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of a funny thing. I think it was real simple, but just go looking and see what you see, is what I like to do, you know. Now, newer 41 TD controllers have a quick learn procedure that can be selected with a scan tool. Uh, replace the transmission control module of the DRB3, perform quick learn and reprogram. A lot of your other higher end scan tools will have that same thing on there. Um, when do they update? The lower reverse clutch volume updates during a 2 1 or a 3 1 downshift. Remember this. It'll be on the test, okay? All right, 2 4 clutch volume updates during a 1 2 upshift. Fluid analysis by stimulation of copper alpha reactions. Have you remembered that yet? Could you say it if I asked you to? The overdrive clutch volume updates during a 2 3 upshift. The underdrive clutch volume updates during a 4 3 or 4 2 downshift. When CVIs are high, the transmission will go into a limp mode. It will always be in second gear when going forward. What they're wanting you to do is be able to get to where you're going. You know, so they do. I mean, if they put it in first gear, well, there won't be a problem with that. The engine's tacking out too high, right? If you put it in high gear, it can't take off over the tube. So they put it in second gear, which is pretty well a good, you know, solid. You can take off good, you can go a decent speed. 
Low CBI numbers will not cause that, so don't go after those ones the transmission not shifting right. Student called me to tell me her car needed transmission work because it was trying to take off in some other gear besides first. She didn't know what gear was taking off in. And so uh, my advice was to check the fuses. Does that make sense? Does it or doesn't it? He says it doesn't. And you all say it does. What do you say? I got a shrug. I got one no. I got two yeses. Okay. Her dad said I was an idiot. She checked the fuses, found one blown, and it fixed the car. <laughs> it's funny or what? Look at this. This is the funny story here. What's this fuse feed? All the transmission solenoids. If you got a fuse that's feeding all the transmission solenoids and that fuse is blown, if you don't have any power feeding into your transmission solenoids, it's going to be in a limp end mode and it's going to take off in high gear. Right? Seen that on Jeeps? <coughs> Ranger will do that? A whole bunch of them. If you've got a solenoid, the same solenoid, the same fuse that feeds the oxygen sensor heaters on that Ranger also feeds the transmission solenoids. You know that? All right. My car needs a starter, she said. I said, how do you know? She said, it won't spin over. I said, get it over here, we'll fix it. She took the belt, we took the belt off and it started. Whenever you started, you go, thump, 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 thump. We took the belt off and mm -hmm. fired up. AC clutch bearing was locked up. We put a bearing in there for 17 bucks. <laughs> no starter needed. Point second rate amateur mistakes. Use common sense and think before you wrench. Right? Know how the system or component works. Check the easy stuff before you go into the hard and expensive stuff. Don't do the tire rotation until after you finish the oil change, right? We already talked about that. Charts, trade papers. All right, fourth and sixth. Is that what you got? Yeah. You got fourth and sixth? Fourth and sixth sound right to you? Which solenoids are on in third gear? You got that one? Customer says this video is a lead shift. Road testing, you find a vehicle only has second and third. Shift solo at A is always off. If it's off all the way, if it's off, are you going to have reverse? Or are you going to have first? You're going to have second and third, but you're not going to have fourth, are you? Customer complains this vehicle is missing or skipping shifts. SSB is always on. He said, you know, you realize it started off in third and shifts to fourth. See, if this one here is always owned, you're going to have issues in those gears. If shift solely C fails off, which gears would be available? Fails off, right? You'd have reverse first, third, and fourth, wouldn't you? Because it's owned in fifth and second. Is this coming clearer to you now? You know what I mean? Are you understanding what we're looking at here and why we're trying to parse these charts? You getting that? Or are you totally out in left field? Yeah. Customer says the transmission is missing shifts. Road test shifts from third to third and then neutralizes when shift to the fourth. Intermediate overdrive band. Yeah. See that? What's applied? First to third goes to third, see, because it never sees second, because that's not a plane. And then when it hits fourth, it goes, boom. All right, it says this transmission is the harsh engagement. That's going to be the direct clutch. So we've got a harsh shift between second and third. What happens here? Between second and third, that engages, right? See, sometimes they don't describe it right. Like you'll have a Harsh engagement to me means when you put it in gear, it goes boom, you know, it bangs real loud. All right. Customer complaints of no reverse and then the transmission neutralizes when it shifts from third and never achieves fourth. See that? Neutralizes, never achieves fourth. What you got there? No reverse. See how, what all those gears have in common? That's what you're looking at on that chart. This is trying, I'm trying to get you to understand this by, you know, running into this thing. Customer complains the transmission neutralizes will make a sharp turn low oil fluid. Wrong dipstick in there or something. Right? How do you know that? Huh? 
when you go around a curve, it sloshes, and the pump loses pressure. Nothing to it. Remember that? All right. Shift solenoid A fails on. Which gears will be available? All gears except fourth and fifth. Shift solenoid A. See that? It's on through all those gears, but if it stays on and low, you're not going to get fourth and fifth for you. You don't feel like you've been beat up? No, no, that wasn't that bad. Huh? Wasn't that bad, was it? When you started looking at it, did it look scary? Yeah, but then uh, when I sat there and started reading stuff, I mean, that was that last one was it You were smart enough to figure it out once you got serious about yeah, looking at it. Yeah, that part, part, right? Huh? Then, then I switched over. I didn't know what I was looking at. 